number one. So I'm a 19-year-old guy that lives in Montreal, Quebec. About two years from now, I was studying at the Ahunstic College. One day, I had a four-hour break because of a class that got cancelled. So I decided to go to Montreal and eat in a pretty good restaurant. I live in a town near Montreal, so I didn't know the city really well. I took the metro and got out in the middle of the city. As I got outside, I saw a weird guy at the side of the door. I thought it was a poor guy asking for money, so I went the other direction on the street. At one point, I took the wrong turn and ended up going the other way. When I realized my mistake, I was in an empty street, so I turned around to go back, and behind me, about 50 meters away, is a weird guy from the metro. We were about 10 minutes of walk away from the metro station. I passed next to him, and after a minute, I looked behind me and see the guy turned and start following me again. So I realized at that point what was going on, and I decided to check if he was really following me. So I took about three to four random turns, and he followed me all the time. I am six foot two, but only around 140 pounds, but I just came out of a self-defense class, so I knew some tricks to get someone on the ground. After I confirmed that he was following me, I turn on a corner and hide behind a garbage can. When he passed next to it, I grabbed him by his left arm and pushed him on the wall and blocked his arm behind his back while I did that. I see a fucking knife falling from the hand of the guy. I pushed the knife away and took my phone to call the police. While we were waiting for the cops to arrive, I held them in the same position and he kept begging me to let him go that it was just a joke. When the cops arrived, they took him inside the cop car and the guy started crying. When I think about what I did to him, grabbing his arm and blocking him on the wall, I realized that things could have gone in a completely different way and that I was lucky that day. Number two. I didn't think I'd ever revisit this, but this event changed my life and still affects me to this day. I apologize in advance for the length, but I promise all of these details are relevant. I was in the 8th grade. I was a typical 13 year old girl who loved pop music, lip gloss, and talking about boys. My best friend Tiffany and I were inseparable. We had every class together, ate lunch together, even spent the night with each other every single weekend and called each other every single day after school. We had another friend named Ashley. She was a lot more boy crazy than Tiffany and I. She was far more adventurous too. She had already had her first kiss and was seriously crushing on this guy, Adam. She talked about him constantly, to the point where Tiffany and I were indifferent about it. Adam was a hellion. One night at a football game he doused his hand in Axe body spray and lit it on fire. And for a reason that escaped me, Ashley was infatuated with him. He wasn't great looking, so I think she was attracted to his bad boy demeanor. The four of us were in concert band together. Now, this was the era of MySpace, Zanga, and Angelfire, the old school social websites. I had an account on each site, and spent a lot of time online. Harmless stuff that my parents knew about and approved of. During football season, after every home game, my school would host a dance that we called a sock hop. At one dance, Tiffany introduced me to a friend that she had met online, Tyler. He didn't go to our school, so he had to have snuck in. He had a sense of humor that was a bit too dark for my taste, but I thought he was an all-around nice guy. At the end of the dance, Tyler asked me for my phone number, not in a crushing on me kind of way, but in more of a we should keep in touch kind of way. I obliged, and the night ended. Tyler would occasionally send me a harmless, what up girl, and we'd exchange small talk via text every couple of weeks. Tiffany, however, talked to him non-stop. She developed a crush on him and stopped calling me after school. They started going to the mall without inviting me, and it led to the two of us drifting apart. With Tiffany and Ashley chasing boys, I was all alone. I was doing my own thing at school. 
I still saw Tiffany and Ashley every day, but things just weren't the same between us. One morning before the first bell, I was walking to my locker. I met up with Tiffany since her locker was right beside mine. We were exchanging awkward small talk when I heard a hand poke Tiffany's shoulder. We both turned around and saw Ashley, wide-eyed with delight. I was intrigued. Was she about to divulge a juicy story about a boy? She smiled and said, look what I've got, and unzipped her small purse. I peek into it and see about ten white, oval-shaped pills. I had never seen drugs in person before, so I was obviously taken aback. Where'd you get those? What are they? I exclaimed. She just grinned and replied, Adam gave them to me. I'm going to take them after first period. No! I angrily responded. Ashley, you can't. You don't know what those are. You have to get rid of them right now. She scoffed and smirked. Shut the fuck up. Adam said I'll be fine. The first period bell rang and she strutted off, satisfied with herself. I was in shock. I asked Tiffany, What are we going to do? She can't take those. To my surprise, Tiffany didn't even seem slightly concerned. She just started walking to class, and I followed, nauseous with worry for Ashley. The first half of the day was a blur because I couldn't focus. I was sick with worry. Before I knew it, it was time for lunch. I took a tray and sat down at an empty lunch table. I was half-heartedly stirring my mashed potatoes when I heard an outburst from the hallway behind me, then loud sobbing and screaming. What the... I thought as I turned around and saw Ashley on her knees, bawling. Before I could process much else, three of my contraband friends saw me, bolted to my table, and sat down. And they told me that Adam was taken out of class on a stretcher and was on the way to the hospital. He'd had a seizure due to a drug overdose. Instantly, I felt my stomach in my throat. All I could think about was Ashley. I looked back into the hallway, and she was being escorted to the bathroom by a female teacher. Everyone at my table just started crying, and I joined in, absolutely dumbstruck by what was unfolding. I couldn't eat even a single bite of food. Lunch period came and went. The next class was my concert band, so I made my way to the band building behind the school. I found a seat in the back of the room. My teacher wasn't there yet, and kids slowly poured in, somber and sad. Was Adam dead? Did Ashley take those damn pills? My mind was going about a thousand miles an hour. I saw Tiffany walk in, but she didn't see me. She sat alone at the front of the room. I anxiously waited for Ashley to walk in, but she never showed. About ten minutes later, my teacher, another teacher, and two police officers walk in. The four men stood at the front of the room, in front of the instrument closet. As some of you may have heard, began one officer, there's been an incident involving several students. Several? I gulped to myself. Now, one student is being treated at the hospital right now, and he has informed us that he has supplied some powerful pills to about a dozen other students. My heart sank. What the actual fuck was happening right now? We need your help and your cooperation. If you know of anyone, we mean anyone, who may be holding or using these pills, we need to know about it. Please, you could be saving a life. The other officer added, If you'd like to help us, please come to the front of the class. And Officer Smith will talk to you in the instrument closet. Ashley raced through my mind. She wasn't in class, so I wasn't sure if she was okay or if she was passed out on the bathroom floor. I saw three kids start slowly standing up and shuffling their way to the front of the class. One at a time, they were taken into the closet and the door closed behind them. After about two minutes, the door would open and the kid would walk out, defeated, and just sit back down. The whole time I was terrified. I didn't want to get Ashley in trouble, but more importantly, I didn't want her to get hurt. Ultimately, I decided that a mad Ashley was better than a dead Ashley. I stood up and made my way to the closet. I told them everything and started sobbing almost immediately. When the door opened, I had to walk all the way back to the class while crying like a baby. Of course, everyone noticed. I looked at Tiffany, and her eyes met mine with a knowing leer. I didn't even have to utter a word. She already knew what I had done. As it turns out, Ashley and the 12 other students who had the pills in their possession were expelled for the remainder of the school year. This was in November, so that was a majority of the school year. 
I tried calling Ashley to check on her, but she ignored me. I have no doubt that Tiffany told her that I had ratted her out. I never found out if she took any pills, but mad at me or not, I was glad she was alive and safe. This is where shit really starts hitting the fan. Over Christmas break, I spent a lot of the time online, because it was too yucky outside to go anywhere. The whole drug bust was behind me, but I was left with an empty feeling because I hadn't heard from Ashley, and Tiffany stopped talking to me nearly altogether. One morning, I logged into my Zanga account, and to my surprise, my inbox was swamped with private messages and comments. I thought it was due to not logging in for a couple of weeks, so I excitedly opened my inbox. What I saw floored me. Every message was filled with the most foul, hateful threats that I had ever seen. I know what you did, bitch. You fucking slut. Fucking narc. I'm gonna kill you, you stupid cunt. Your family's gonna die because you're a nasty slut. Go to hell, you nasty whore. Everyone hates you because of what you did. I felt like throwing up. Every message in my inbox was like this. About 30 in total. The comments were just as bad. Except they were posted to my public page. Where everyone could read them. I read the username. Deathtrap69. I didn't know who this was. Disgusted, I clicked on the name to reveal the profile. The photo was of this guy in a heavy eyeliner. And his pierced tongue was sticking out. Who the hell was this? I clicked on his photo album to find a better photo to identify this person, and what I saw made my blood run cold. It was Tyler, the guy from the sock hop that Tiffany had met online. Immediately I knew that Tiffany had turned on me. I couldn't believe what was happening. I turned off the computer and cried for hours. I didn't sleep much that night at all. About a week passed before I gathered the courage to go online again. I reluctantly logged into my Zanga account and it had gotten worse. Over 50 comments and messages, all of them were just as vicious, and every message contained two links at the end. Zanga.com slash let's not meet please is a slut. Zanga.com slash let's not meet please will die soon. Horrified beyond belief, I clicked on the first link. The page was black with red text, and the headline was spinning. Let's not meet please is a fucking slut. Through teary eyes, I looked at the profile picture. It was a photo of me making a goofy face, sitting at the lunch table at the school. There's only one person who knew about this photo, because she's the one that took the photo on her phone. And Tiffany. All suspicions I had were abundantly clear in that moment. She and Tyler were obviously behind this. Then I clicked on the second link. This page was even more terrifying than the first one. It said horrible things like, Let's not meet please is going to pay for what she did. Let's not meet please is going to die tonight. I'm going to kill let's not meet please and her whole fucking family. I know where this cunt lives and I'm going to stab her brother. I'm going to slit her throat and laugh as she bleeds to death. I'm going to stab her in the heart in her sleep. She's a rotten cunt and she deserves to fucking die. I realized the severity of the situation when I saw this page. Tiffany obviously knew where I lived because she used to spend the night with me regularly. She was perfectly capable of telling Tyler where I lived. He said he was going to kill my family. That night I threw up for hours. My parents thought I had the stomach flu. They knew about what had happened at school, but I didn't want to tell them about this. Somehow, I thought I would get in trouble. As time passed, I received these messages on my Zanga almost daily. Then it started on my MySpace. And then I started getting emails, then text messages, then phone calls from blocked numbers and nasty voicemails from a male voice, undoubtedly Tyler. This was all day, every day, for months. I was afraid to step outside. When spring semester started, I started getting handwritten threats in my locker. One day I found a razor blade taped to the lever on my locker door. I didn't eat lunch at school because I was afraid of being poisoned. I didn't go to the bathroom at school for fear of being jumped. I was terrified of Tiffany. Eventually, I caved in and told my parents. They called the police, and the police started an investigation. They said that they took these incessant threats very seriously. The school was informed about Tiffany's actions, and she was suspended for a week. I told my guidance counselor and the principal, and they moved me to all different classes in a different lunch period. My state police made a visit to my house and collected my statement. I was escorted to and from the school building by my mom every day for the rest of the year. The hoopla that surrounded me was starting to get more attention at school. 
and people had stopped talking to me altogether. I endured the rest of my 8th grade year in fearful silence. I deleted all online accounts, Zanga, MySpace, AngelFire, even my email address. I got my phone number changed and didn't share it with anyone except my mom, dad, and brother. I couldn't even make my own voicemail greeting because my dad didn't want me to divulge my name on my new cell phone line. Once a week for about six months, a local officer would stop by my house and check in on me and my family. Since I had no more online ties and a new phone number, the threats stopped. This incident made me much more cautious about what I share online and who I share my phone number with. Even as a grown woman, I absolutely don't give it to people I've just met. I never saw Tiffany again after 8th grade. Instead of continuing on to 9th grade at the same school, I transferred to an out-of-state high school and everything slowly became normal for me again. As for Tyler, he never faced any charges. Like I said, I only met him one time, but he's still in the back of my mind whenever I'm out in public. If I ever ran into him today, I'm not sure what I'd do. I haven't changed that much, and since I have distinct facial features, I'm sure he'd recognize me. Hopefully he moved out of the area, and he's someone else's problem now. So, Tiffany and Tyler, let's never meet again. Edit. I forgot to add this, but for the entirety of my freshman year while I was at a different school, Tiffany worked hard to spread the most vicious rumors about me at my former school. The worst one I can remember is that my dad liked to watch me change clothes, and I changed in front of him all the time while he pleasured himself. Once I found out about these rumors, I told my dad, and he went to Tiffany's house and told her dad. All he did was ground her for a week. Oh well. Number three. When I was 18, I worked at a local coffee shop in my hometown, and I often worked there, picking up shifts and closing six nights a week. I had a lot of regulars and lots of randoms, but other than a few awkward orders, I never really had a problem with a customer being inappropriate or out of hand. This night was already really stressful for me, as it was Halloween. Not that it has anything to do with the interaction, and I was a little bummed to be closing while my friends were out and about. But I had friends go to a house that my friends rented right down the street after work with some pastries and Red Bull, so I really didn't mind too much. It was about 9.45, and I was already ready to close right at 10. It had been dead since about 8, and all I had to do was the final register count. Everything was clean, and I was reading a book to pass the time, trying not to watch the clock. Our counter, by the way, is like a bar counter, long, with a register near the door at the closed end, and with the one far end open for us to go in and out of, right near the door to our back room. A man walked in the front door. He looked like he was in his mid-twenties. He was black, had on a big hoodie, and was wearing sweatpants that sagged down so I could see the waistbands of two different pairs of gym shorts underneath. I am a young white female, but I have no fear of people, and I'm not a racist, so I didn't bat an eyelash when he walked in with one hand in a hoodie pocket and the other in the pocket of one of the pairs of gym shorts. Men of all races wear clothes like that and carry themselves that way, at least where I live. So with no concern, I greeted him and asked him how he was and what he was thinking of ordering. He took his time responding, but wasn't looking at the menu or at our chalkboard with seasonal drink offers. He was looking at the front door. He took about a minute, then turned to me and asked my name. I often had male customers ask this, females too, so I told him, and then asked again what he was looking to order. He began to ask me more questions about me and my job. He asked if I liked it. I responded, thinking maybe he wanted a job application and gave him a very short version of how I felt. It was almost 9.50. I kept checking my phone, thinking that I just wanted to make his drink so I could clean up again and meet my friends. He nodded, saying he thought I liked my job, which I thought was strange. 
but again didn't think about it. I agreed again. He then started to ask about the shifts I worked. I figured he had sympathy that it was Halloween, and I gave him a vague answer. He then asked why I didn't work on Thursdays. My heart jumped. I didn't see that one coming from a mile away. I struggled to respond, and he continued, and asked if Sunday mornings were better than Wednesday nights. At this point, I broke into nervous laughter and smiles, asking if he was looking to work for the coffee shop, and that we needed the help. He stopped smiling at this point, and his hand in the hoodie pocket made an abrupt move to the very inside pair of gym shorts, basically so that he would be grabbing himself. He didn't quite reach in all the way, and I felt like I was going to pass out. I asked him to order or leave, as the end of our business day was almost there, and that I needed to clean and lock up. At this point, I grabbed my cell phone and kept it in my hand, thinking how I can dial 911 and not have him begin to molest himself in front of me, or whatever he planned on doing. He began to sort of lean on the counter and ask me questions. He asked me where I lived. Did I have a boyfriend? What were my plans for the night? I was trying hard not to cry and tried my best to lie through more vague answers, hoping he would go away if I just didn't freak out. He began to move away from the register, still leaning on the counter, hands in his pants, towards the open end of the bar. I began to back as far towards the front door as possible, but that end had no opening and was so high I couldn't jump it without considerable effort and climbing over an espresso machine. The only other exit I could think of was our narrow drive through window. Clutching my phone, I asked him what he wanted. For some reason, he stopped. He stood up and looked towards the front door, then turned to look at the clock behind him. I took the chance to start writing a text message to my friend, and I said, If I am not at your place in 10 minutes, call the police. He caught me sending the text and asked me who I was texting. I told him my boyfriend, and his face became something that I will never forget. His eyes blazed, and he was still as stone. He calmly told me to throw my cell phone across the floor, specifically telling me to try and throw it to the drive through I had to really toss it about nine feet away. After, he began to scream, making his way again down the counter. He asked me how I could have a boyfriend when he has been watching me at work for the last two months as often as possible and had never seen a man drop me off or pick me up at work. He pointed to the side of the building that I parked on and said he knew I parked my blue Toyota there earlier and not to lie to him. I asked him to leave, beginning to cry. He began to describe my work shifts to a T when I came in when I left, how I smoked across the street on break. He told me that he knew that I only drank the Diet Coke that we sold, and that I always cranked my music up when I started in my car. At that point, he pulled a small gun out of the gym shorts and waved it around as he said that I was stupid to lie to him, that he knew it all. He was going between enraged and laughing, as if he couldn't believe that I didn't want to talk to him, or that it was funny that I was scared. I offered him all the money in the register, and he laughed again like hysterically, and then again went still. I'll never forget this moment, as he said, I am not here for any money, Marina. I am not here for a job. I think you know what I am here for. I'm sobbing now, and it made him either frustrated or sympathetic, and he began to say how I just needed to calm down, that he was just really excited to meet me. He still had one hand down near his dick and began to fondle himself, holding the gun with the other hand and about three feet away from the opening in the bar. I asked him again to please leave. When he didn't move, I asked him what I did to him and why this was happening. He began to speak, saying that I was really pretty. He was continuing to talk when all of a sudden, my friend walked in the door with his friends in tow. There were five guys all together and all in a metal band together, so they are a pretty distinct group of guys. The man quickly put the gun in the hoodie pocket, so quickly 
that only two of my friends noticed it. He ran for the door, pushing past my friends, and disappeared into the night. I threw up as soon as he was gone, and two of my friends ran after him, but didn't gain on him enough and didn't see where he went to. I quit my job the next day and called the police, and there was never any follow-up, and I still wonder about what the fuck did or didn't happen to me that night. What is up guys? If you haven't already, go check out Blue Spooky. You've got a big surprise coming to you. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Go check it out! <laughs> Go check it out! <laughs> Go check it out! <laughs> I gave a link in my description below, so go ahead and click over and subscribe to his channel. Obviously you can see he's a very good narrator. He's got a lot of potential, and if he keeps it up, I think he can get a lot bigger. So, big shout out to him. And thanks for the collaboration.